If you haven't heard of London, well it's comfortably the biggest city in Western Europe, and the capital of both England and the UK. And Great Britain, I guess. But more importantly, it's the stadium capital of Europe, and arguably the stadium capital of the world. With that being said, here are the stadiums and arenas of London, with a capacity of 4,000 or more. Brisbane Road. This ground is one of the more intriguing designs going round. Yes, for the most part it looks like a traditional English football stadium, with each of the four stands being separate from one another and built in contrasting styles. Even a bit of gable action on one of them. Very old school. But, well, by now you will have noticed something unusual about the ground. The corners are filled, not with seats, but buildings. And they're not filled with offices or concessions like at some venues, but they're actually apartment buildings. That was done for financial reasons, obviously, but I kind of like that look. The Den. Its predecessor, also known as The Den, was regarded as one of the most dangerous stadiums to visit in the country for away supporters. To be clear, that was due to Millwall supporters rather than the structure itself. Although maybe there was a bit of both. The new den is certainly a lot safer to visit. Although the amenities are decent, the evenly sized double tiered stands on each side leave it looking uh, symmetrical and, well there's just not a whole lot of character. A lot better than being stabbed for wearing a West Ham shirt though. Originally built for the 2012 Olympics where it hosted several events, Copper Box Arena now hosts multiple teams from multiple sports. The main tenant being the London Lions, a basketball team. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear to be made of copper. But then again, copper is expensive and it turns green after a while. Much like caviar. For its modest size, apparently the venue can get quite loud. Perhaps that's due to the steep seats and low ceiling. Hayes Lane. Besides the very modern all-seater stand in the south that was built just a few years back, it's a fairly humble old-fashioned football stadium with plenty of terracing and not much in the way of luxury. Not even the luxury of real grass. You'd imagine that they have plans to eventually make the rest of the ground look like the south stand. Not sure though. Brentford Community Stadium. This is anything but old-fashioned. It's one of the latest additions to London's stadium collection, and has a design like no other. The funky shaped outer structure is a little polarizing, but I think it looks great. It looks that way partially due to the room constraints that they had on the site, combined with the architect caring little about tradition. I mean that in a good way. I love those seats which are a collage of the Brentford and London Irish colors. Not sure where the yellow came from. Queen's Club Centre Court The Queen's Club Championship is the main lead-in tournament to Wimbledon. This venue is actually partially temporary because most of the capacity comes from stands that are erected prior to the tournament. I still thought it was worth a mention. Stamford Bridge is one of the oldest football stadiums in the city. You can tell that it's very old because modern scientific methods are able to determine that this is in fact a stadium and not a bridge. Although technically it was an athletics venue for the first few decades of its existence, so you could argue that it's not the same stadium. Anyway, that particular type of brick they've used on the outside isn't for me, but the interior is quite stunning. Particularly the triple tiered west stand. One downside is that it's perhaps a little small for a big club, but that's their problem. The Valley. That's a much more appealing name than The Den. I believe it gets that name because in the early years the ground was made from makeshift stands that were basically mounds of earth, resembling a valley. These days it has a much higher concrete ratio than most valleys, but it's still a sight for sore eyes. Especially the covered end. You know the covered end, it's the one that's covered. Victoria Road. This ground is home to a club called Dagenham and Redbridge. I would have thought that if you combine the might of both Dagenham and Redbridge, that'd be an unstoppable force, but no. It's yet another non-league club. 
This is a little more built up compared to the other non-league grounds we've seen. A mix of covered seating, covered terracing and open terracing. This place has got it all. Emirates Stadium. Arsenal was the first London-based Premier League club to move from their longtime home to a modern bowl-style stadium, mainly in order to generate more revenue, as is usually the case. I guess they were trendsetters because their rival Tottenham immediately built their own new stadium 12 years later. As usual for this type of stadium, it sports an exterior made of plenty of steel and glass. And yeah, it's a pretty decent venue. The main downside for me is that they're such a big club, but unlike basically every other club of their size, they don't have a unique home. Benfica bought the same model, just opted not to go for the added extras. The O2 doesn't currently have a permanent sports tenant, it's more of a music venue, but it does consistently host various sporting events every year. It's known for its distinctive dome structure which actually predates the interior. Yeah, when it first opened it wasn't even an arena on the inside, just some sort of exhibition. Now it's London's premier indoor venue. Crystal Palace National Sports Centre It hasn't got to do with the football club but they're named for the same reason. It's in the Crystal Palace area. It's good to see that unlike a lot of European countries, England keeps their football and their athletics separate. Although having said that, I just remember that Croydon FC moved in here a couple of years ago. So they haven't really done that here. But in the top tiers, there's nary a track to be seen. The Hive Stadium. It gets that unusual name because it's home to Barnett, who are nicknamed the Bees. And the homes that Bees build for themselves, whatever they're called, are known for being a hive of activity. Hence, the Hive Stadium. Although it's fairly simple and lacking in the hexagons I was expecting, its clean modern design might be the most impressive non-league stadium there is. Barring maybe Notts County. Lee Valley Velo Park Velodrome. That was fun to say. This is something a bit different. Not just the fact that it's a velodrome, but it reminds me of the Saddle Dome in Canada which, as I've mentioned in the past, looks more like a Pringle than a saddle. And guess what? This place gets the nickname The Pringle. Great minds think alike, so I guess it's the same for stupid people. As with most velodromes, it looks freaking cool on the inside. I still feel for track cyclists though. They get paid much less than road cyclists, they don't get to look at the scenery past them by, and presumably they always have to wear elasticated pants, or trousers as you might call them. Starting out on the side of what was a cabbage patch well over a hundred years ago, Twickenham has slowly transformed piece by piece over the years into the somewhat modern triple tiered bowl style stadium that it is today. Now it's not flashy for the most part, but it's the biggest rugby specific stadium in the world, and it's also regarded by many as the home of rugby union, outside of the rugby school, the actual home of rugby. It's home to the World Rugby Museum as well. The main criticism I have about this place is that if you happen to be wearing a rugby league shirt within the stadium, you will get tased, arrested and deported back to the north. Or Australia. Twickenham Stoop. Or Little Bear Bear Twickenham as I like to call it. It's the home of Harlequins, unsurprisingly a rugby union club. Despite sharing the name, the two stadiums couldn't be any more different. Well, no, it could be a tortoise, but tortoise. they don't have any design language in common. This is more in line with a typical club rugby stadium. Except for perhaps the Eastern Stand, which appears to be inspired by a spoiler from one of those tuna cars. And yeah, I guess the seats are quite colourful as well, so it's, it's basically the Fast and Furious of stadiums. The SSC Arena, or just Wembley Arena. It has a fascinating history, opening in the 1930s as an aquatics venue, and being modernised in the mid-2000s. As you can see though, it has still kept some of its old school charm. The exterior is more or less how it was back in the day. Once again, it's definitely more of a music venue, but it does host the occasional sporting event. This cricket ground is officially known as Kennington Oval, 
But over the years, its ego has grown so much that it simply goes by THE Oval. It actually saves a lot of confusion because there's another cricket ground in Barbados called Kensington Oval. The Oval is one of the oldest cricket stadiums in the world and while it still features some antiquated design elements, particularly to the south, it is overall one of English cricket's more modern looking venues, especially the big sweeping grandstand on the northern side of the ground, with its sleek roof. It's odd how the square runs all the way to the boundary, not really a square at this point. Tottenham Hotspur Stadium I've covered this modern marvel quite a lot, so I'll talk about some of the lesser known features, such as these video boards are actually bigger than any other in a Western European stadium. Okay, not bad. Uh, it's the only stadium in the Football League to be named after the club that it's home to. Better than a corporate sponsor, I suppose. Uh, the roof was actually designed for the sound of the crowd to reverberate as quickly as possible, which helps the chants sound clear and crisp. So there's no ambiguity over whether the F-bomb has been dropped. Uh. We know about the retractable field, the self stand is, is big. Um, what else? <coughs> Craven Cottage? Well, look no further because this stadium has one. Ooh, actually, I wonder if they sell cottage pie here. Anyway, this is one of the most characterful grounds in the country. There is actually a cottage, like I said, it's over 100 years old. There's also a bit of gable action once more, but its most distinctive aspect is that they had to purchase a section of the river to Hames in order to carry out an expansion, and I'd wager that it's the only stadium in the world that can say the same. I'll keep mispronouncing the name of that river until you spell it right. At least switch the A for an E. Wait, no, uh, never mind. Stonex Stadium. Stonex is a financial company, not to be confused with Fred Flintstone's failed private space exploration endeavour. Anyway, if you yabba dabba do have to play rugby at a stadium with a track around the field, there is one thing you can <sighs> yabba dabba do to get the fans closer to the field and that's what they've done. Adding some stands right behind the post and on the western side, some stands right in front of the permanent stands. Not ideal, not pretty, but it's what they've got. Selhurst Park. It's nearly 100 years old, which is not that uncommon in English football, but it remains one of the most antiquated stadiums in the Premier League. However, it has its upsides, most notably the charming old-fashioned aesthetic. But I suppose if you're sat behind a pillar, that matters very little. Renovations are inevitable though, and I think it'll look pretty different in a decade's time. Hopefully it keeps some of the charm of the current stadium. But I do like that the proposed design appears to evoke the Crystal Palace itself. Science teaches us that for every Stonex Stadium, there's a Skyx Community Stadium. It simply consists of the main stand and standing room along the perimeter of the rest of the field. But the main stand is rather impressive for a small club. Plenty of skyboxes, which is fitting. Perhaps not high enough to be called that, but who cares. The Arm Prince Foundation Stadium, or Loftus Road as most people still like to call it. Not because they don't respect the cause, it's just it's been called Loftus Road for over a century. And over that time it's grown tremendously in capacity, but the footprint has grown very little, because it can't really. Not without destroying people's homes. So it's a very compact venue. A sardine tin without the rounded edges, and fish. At least the spectators are all close to the field. Parkview Road. To be honest, I'm struggling to find interesting things to say about these tiny non-league grounds, so I'll make something up. This stadium was actually the inspiration behind Francis Bacon's famous painting, The Persistence of Memory. It was a huge Welling United fa fan, and there was, there, he was there when the stadium's clock melted due to an electrical malfunction. So yeah, that's where cufflinks were invented. Lord's Cricket Ground. The oldest cricket stadium in the world is also probably the most famous cricket stadium in the world. The two often go hand in hand. Jesus is quite famous. 
you don't get much more of a contrast at any other stadium between the 130 year old pavilion and the Space Age Media Center at the other end. But they somehow just work together. I should also mention the infamous slope that runs across the ground. It's odd that the showpiece ground of English cricket isn't even level, but I love it. Gander Green Lane. It's the home of a club that spent its history as a non-league club, but was recently promoted to the 4th division. So they had to upgrade the ground a little bit, including replacing the fake turf pitch with natural grass, as well as the addition of a new stand. It still has rounded corners, which is a little unusual. It's very much like a sardine tin without the cramped conditions. And fish. London Stadium. London has hosted the Olympics three times, but this is the only stadium that remains. It was initially a purpose-built track and field venue, but after some modifications, it's doing a decent impression of a football stadium. However, it's currently the only Premier League stadium that isn't rectangular, and thus cops a lot of flack. But what it lacks in right angles, it makes up for in interesting little tidbits, such as they actually use surplus pipes that were meant for a gas pipeline to support the roof. And just like Brentford, they've gone for those interesting triangular floodlight arrangements. Uh, in its 10 year history, it's hosted every major sport there is, except for the ones it hasn't. And it has the most generic name for a stadium in existence. Grosvenor Vale. This one just scrapes past the cutoff point of 4000. Which is good because this place is known for one particular supporter known as the Wheelstone Raider. If he was young and like 6 foot 3, I'd imagine people would have called him a dickhead and moved on. But because he's short and older, he's become a bit of a minor celebrity. Anyway, it's about as basic as the ground you can get, with less than a thousand seats and just... Just stand wherever you want, who cares? Centre Court You've got to love Wimbledon, but I'm surprised it hasn't suffered at the hands of cancel culture due to its white-only policy. Yes, players must only wear white clothing, but then again it's the same with Test Cricket. Anyway, the ivy-clad Centre Court gets the name Centre Court, because it's a court in the centre of the Old England Club. In 2009, England's first retractable roof at a sports venue was added. Long overdue, I think. They weren't happy with the name slightly off-centre court, so Wimbledon's number two court is known as number one court. Although there is an appreciable amount of aesthetic continuity... Did... Did I really just say that? Only people who wear turtlenecks would utter such a phrase. Although it looks somewhat similar to Centre Court, it's 75 years younger. This one only got its retractable roof in 2019. Then you've got the number 2 court which has a capacity of exactly 4000. Quite a basic seating bowl, not much to say. And yeah, then you've got the number 3 court and uh, Via Vum Sex Sieben Ox, etc. Speaking of Wimbledon, the new Plough Lane is home to AFC Wimbledon. It's an interesting design for sure, incorporating apartment buildings, similar to Brisbane Road. Not quite the same. Also, although it's not immediately apparent, three of the stands, the three smaller ones, are actually temporary. They're still solid concrete structures, but they'll be demolished in the not too distant future, to make way for larger stands. Speaking of Wimbledon, again, Kings Meadow was their former home. It's now home to Chelsea's women's team and the under-23s, but was actually built for yet another club known as Kingstonian. There's not much to say about the design itself, mostly seated, one small terrace, pretty typical. Not exactly a meadow fit for a king, but royalty is overrated. They can't even sweat. Wembley Stadium. The UK's biggest stadium, and actually the largest stadium in the world, where all the seats are covered. You don't really need a proper retractable roof for football in Western Europe. But I guess if the rain was really bad, you could tie a tarp to the giant arch and make the world's largest lean-to shelter. The ends of the roof are however retractable, but this is just to allow more sunlight to help the grass grow. Enough about the roof. As you may already know, it was built from scratch on the site of the old Wembley Stadium 
It's like the phoenix of stadiums. Hopefully it's another 40 years at the very least until the next iteration comes around, because this one's fantastic. And those were the stadiums and arenas of London. Did I miss any? Almost certainly. But regardless, if you enjoyed the video and you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching, have a good one.